Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call the Monday, March 20th school committee meeting um, at 6.30 p.m. here at Colbert um, to order. Uh, moving right into public comments. I have Teresa Shospansky. have gotten data, just pass around. I have extras if we need extras. Okay. Um, I'm Teresa Shosvansky. I live at 16 Blanchard Boulevard, and I have two children in the elementary schools and a three-year-old who will eventually be in Okay. Um, when I first heard about the work of the task force for inefficiencies and inequities, I was told that one of the reasons for the creation of the task force is the gap between the budget requested by Superintendent Lee and the ability of our town to provide the anticipated funds required to maintain the existing level of programming at Braintree Public Schools. I was told that, number one, town and district leaders have known about this problem for quite some time as we've been using one-time COVID-related elementary and secondary school emergency relief funds to make up for shortfalls in our budget. And number two, the alleged reason for our budgetary shortfalls is due to a declining enrollment, um, some of which has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. I'd like to point out the following. Under Massachusetts state law, chapter 70, school funds and state aid for public schools. All schools and districts in the Commonwealth are appropriated state aid to support school operations. And chapter 70 also establishes minimum spending requirements for each school district, and minimum requirements for each municipality's share of school cost. To calculate a district's foundational budget and required net school spending, the state includes enrollment numbers. Includes the enrollment numbers. The state provides reports on all districts and schools detailing the required net school spending and the actual net school spending for every district reported as a percentage of the required net school spending. Okay, so if a district does not spend at least 100% of the net school spending as required by the state, they must file documentation to explain this shortfall. In, in the school year 2019-2020, the, the most recently released net school spending reports, um, and also the one like prior to the pandemic, right? Um, the actual net school spending percentages across the Commonwealth ranged from as low as 95%, that was at Greater Fall River Botec, to as high as 434% in Provincetown. Braintree's actual net school spending percentage was 128%. In the following two images, which you see on the back, you can see the trend over the five years prior to the COVID-19 pandemic in Braintree's actual net school spending against that of schools listed as, quote, comparable to Braintree on Braintree's accountability profile, as well as schools in the surrounding region. The data indicate neither that we are overspending nor that our shortfall is a pandemic-related phenomenon. If anything, they tell a story of our lack of investment in education relative to our neighbors. Again, this is how we have spent based on foundational budgets that factored in our declining also, none of these spending graphs include investments in buildings. I strongly suspect that our surrounding districts have both higher actual net school spending and better facilities. Mr. Mayor, I'm asking you to fully fund BPS to maintain all current offerings and facilities, utilizing the 8.5 million available in free cash if needed. I'm also asking for you to put forth a dedicated effort to find long-term viable revenue sources to invest in our education system. As you prepare to present your budget for the coming fiscal year, I hope it appropriately meets the needs of our students, teachers, and families. As a data literate citizen, a public educator, parent, and a granddaughter of immigrant dreamers with a typical to pronounce last name that I have kept in honor of them, who transformed the level of privilege afforded to my parents and me through access to public schools, I feel compelled to speak out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Anybody online that would like to speak? One second, please. We have three people online, none of whom have their hand raised. And nobody else here would like to speak that didn't sign up? Oh, okay. Just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Uh, moving on to routine matters. <clears throat> Approval of open session and executive session meeting minutes. Are there any amendments? Um, I have an amendment to the minutes on page four um, under my um, quotes. Um, the second line, um, the word redirecting should just be redistricting. So it's just a change one of word. word. Yeah, okay. one word. And um, in, in an executive session minutes, and it should be uh, Kathy Tuffy and not my name, um, yeah. unless it is and it was an executive session of the finance was an or was it an executive session? It looks like we were all there. So maybe the heading should just be changed to February 2nd executive session is what I think. Okay. Thank you. All right. So the, I think it's the executive session of the February 2nd School committee. School committee meeting. So it should, yeah, not, not, it should not be it should, finance and operations. It should be the school right. committee. Executive, executive session, session. Of, your, of that okay. same date. Okay. Yeah. I believe so, yeah. too. Okay. okay. So with those two amendments, everybody have the amendments? They understand the executive session should have been school committee, not finance and operations. And we're changing one word um, on page four of the school committee meeting. With those changes, I make a motion to accept those minutes. Okay. I have a motion by Ms. Cobbler-Mayor and a second by Ms. Tuffy. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. That is unanimous. Uh, moving on to our communications and commendations. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in your packet, you will find copies of the February 2nd policy and ed minutes, uh, as well as February 2nd uh, minutes from finance and operations. You will also find the most recent update from the South Shore Collaborative, uh, and then what was just passed out prior to the meeting beginning was uh, some information from our music director, Matt Sautel. Over the weekend, we had 23 high school students participate in the Senior SEMS Bar uh, program. Uh, they did exceptionally well. Uh, Mr. Sautel actually was conducting the Senior Mixed Choir this year uh, with about 100 students, of which 10% were Braintree students. Uh, so, uh, again, a very successful weekend for our music students. I wanted to make you aware of that. Yeah. Uh, I'm in, sir. Oh, yeah, I was just going to ask, um, how do they do on their um, fundraiser? The school department did a fundraiser over the I haven't got the actual results from it yet, but if you want a mattress, I know a guy. <laughs> <laughs> was that this past weekend? Yeah, Saturday. Yeah, Saturday. Saturday. Uh, yeah. I missed it. I bought a mattress from uh, the Athletic Association like years ago. Oh, they had something similar. On a very comfortable town. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I think it's a, it's, hopefully they did well. Uh, okay. Any other questions or comments about accommodations? Okay. Moving on to gifts to schools. Again, I will read all of the gifts. If one, I'll ask for one motion and uh, we'll go from there. Braintree High School gifts to schools, totaling $15,825.10. One check in the amount of $3,398.10 from Legacy SP Limited. One check in the amount of $250 from Ex Experitus Language Base Puerto Rico trip. One check in the amount of $250 Social Bank for the 2023 Credit for Life Fair. One check in the amount of $250 from Milton Men's Store for the 2023 Credit for Life. Checks totaling $108 for the BHS Social Studies Human Geo Field Trip. One check in the amount of $160 for Project Prove in memory of Dorothy Gordon. One check in the amount of $2,059 from the Nelson Chin Memorial Fund to be used by the preschool for a communications board. Three checks totaling $9,350 to be used to purchase new gym mats at BHS. The checks were from BHS Athletic Association for $5,000, Quincy Credit Union for $2,875, and the Pacino family $1,475. Bay State Textiles gifts to school totaling $141.75 and district-wide donation to the full-day kindergarten program, gifts to school, $5,000, one check in the amount of $5,000 from the Nelson K. Chin Memorial Fund to be used towards tuition scholarships for FDK families in financial need. Motion to accept, Madam Chair. I have a motion by Mr. Devon. Second. Second by Ms. Cobble-Mayor. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? 
That is unanimous. We are especially grateful to the Nelson K. Chen Memorial Fund for these very generous gifts. And as always, we are very appreciative of all gifts. So thank you very much. So we're going to move into from superintendent and staff, but we're going to take one item out of order. Um, we have our, uh, our director of uh, world languages, Gail Ward, here with us tonight. So the deleveling of eighth grade Spanish. Uh, we're going to move on the agenda. Buenas tardes. <laughs> Thank you for moving me up in the agenda. I very much appreciate that. Um, going to look at my notes, hope no one's offended. In the past several months, I've had numerous conversations with the middle school principals about the possibility of eliminating the honors level for eighth grade Spanish. Although not the intent, these leveling decisions made halfway through seventh grade Spanish often set students on a path that can be difficult for them to change once they get to the high school. These recommendations are based on limited data because seventh grade Spanish only meets three days out of the six in the cycle and recommendations are made a little bit past halfway in the year. The data that they're limited to, the content is, you know, things like numbers, date, time, classroom objects. It's, li it's limited information in order to make that kind of leveling decision. In addition, eighth grade French does not have levels. Therefore, there's some inequity between Spanish and French as a result of that. This would provide more flexibility with scheduling for students, although that is not the primary reason that, that I'm recommending this. Uh, and my intent is not to lower the level of the honors student in, to the what we consider the grade level curriculum. What my intent is to raise all levels to the honors, all students rather, to the honors level, providing whatever supports are necessary so that every student in the eighth grade Spanish um, program can um, access the curriculum. That is my intent. We are also working within our new world language standards, which were passed in 2019. Our old ones were passed in 1999, so it was lovely to get new standards. So this is a perfect opportunity for us as we're aligning our local curriculum to the state standards, we can be looking at our honors level assessments and making um, changes as necessary to help all of our students. That's really what I have. I did um, research what other districts have in there out of all of the districts that I heard back from uh, neighboring districts. No other district has leveling in the middle school program. The one district that did at one point was Hingham and they recently changed to no levels for the very same reasons that I have just um, given you today. Thank you. Ms. Duffy, did you wanna? Um... Yes. So um, this came before policy and education um, two meetings ago and the committee uh, voted to send it to the full com uh, committee for discussion and approval. Um, uh, we felt that um, this board made a compelling case. Um, I did have a couple of questions, and, and uh, Ms. Ward is here to answer any questions today that the committee might have. Uh, so, um, is this um, is this something you need a decision on soon because of uh, course selection sheets or or um, um, scheduling uh, process, which it should be taking place relatively soon. Well, yes, recommendations for from seventh to eighth grade were made, I think, in the past week or two. Um, they may have even been pushed back a couple of days. So they're with they're within the past couple of weeks. They've been due for other subject areas. So scheduling, it is necessary for scheduling um, to be done if we're going to have levels or if we're not going to have levels. The the level recommendations can be done fairly quickly by seventh grade teachers if that needs to happen. I do not know the timeline for from guidance on when like the the absolute drop deadline would need to be. And if I could just interject, um, I would say by the end of April, they would need an answer uh, because they will start scheduling next year in earnest. Uh, and at that point, they need the right data. Did anyone else have any questions about uh, this change? Through the chair. Um, I just wanted to um, 
highlight the, what you said and the fact that it's not going to change the curriculum, um, that you're going to be bringing people up, um, that, um, and this is only affecting eighth grade or middle school. It doesn't affect the high school. Correct. Okay. And I believe by having these heterogeneous classes, we can really fine tune our placement exam that we give in eighth grade when we're making our recommendations for ninth grade. Yeah. I mean, I, I think we should be having Spanish and elementary school, but you know, that's the choir for another subject into the choir. <laughs> discussion. All right. So Thank technically you. this is the first reading, but, and it needs to be voted by April. And I know historically we don't, uh, we don't like to vote first reading. Are you good? Yeah. As far as we have, this will impact kids in a negative way. You know that you're trying to do the proper planning. Excuse me, Madam Chair. Absolutely. But yeah, I'm, I'm all for it. Okay. So since there aren't any questions. Okay. So then is. You want to make a motion? Okay, so I'll make a um, motion to uh, do level eighth grade Spanish for the coming year. I have a motion by Mrs. Tuffy. I'll second that, Madam Chair. Second by Mr. Devin. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That is unanimous. Thank you for being here. I'm just going to ask yes. Share your work. <laughs> Thank you. All right, moving back to the agenda. Uh, Y24 budget presentation. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is obviously a work in progress as we get closer to our deadlines with respect to the mayor presenting his budget to the town. Uh, just to reorient where we are and where we've been. So in FY22, I, I I'm going to talk a lot about the town number uh, because it's very relevant as we talk about next year. So in FY22, the town voted an operating budget for the schools of 71947000 As was mentioned by a previous speaker, we offset um, deficits we had within that budget with one-time money uh, to the tune of $3.1 million. So our spend in FY22 is approximately $75,056,662. That's the top line. In this current school year, uh, the town operating budget is, is supporting the schools to the tune of $73,472,068. But again, we're spending more than that. Uh, we're spending $75,671,683, again, using one-time offset money of $2.1 million, which we put together with uh, the remaining ESSER money that we had uh, and some circuit breaker money. Uh, then uh, at the end of last year, the school committee voted along with town votes that had previously occurred to consolidate facilities within the town. Uh, the result of that was approximately $5 million of our budget went to the town side because they were paying for custodians, maintenance, things of that nature. So our, our FY23, this year's adjusted budget, once you've taken those people out, was $68,494,774. So what we are now spending on the town side is 68,494. Uh, the first pass at next year's budget, which is uh, a level services budget, which you can see at the top, meaning that we would maintain all the programs and positions that we have this year going into next year. Uh, we are looking for a budget of 74,732,869, but that number is now over the 68,494,774, which is an increase of 7.5% to the schools. Um, if you try to do the math on your own, you will get a wrong answer because we have distributed our anticipated COLA increases across multiple years. If you just do 74 minus 68 and do the division, it, you're gonna get a, a different number, but the actual increase is approximately 7.5%. So that's where we are. We continue to work with the mayor's office and our principals and department uh, directors to refine it further, uh, we'll continue to bring back iterations of, of this budget as we move through the, the month of April. Um, but this would keep it. Happy to answer any questions I can. Any questions or comments from the committee? Through the chair? Um, I just want to clarify. So the um, maintenance of effort draft with FY 2024 um, this proposal maintains the current FY 2023 effort, but it doesn't uh, restore any of the critical uh, staff cuts or any of the um, resources that were eliminated from um, the past couple of years. Is that correct? Right. This, this is about what we have this year, this current year, and maintaining all of what we have this year moving into next year. Uh, this does not go back a few years and replace anything that was eliminated at that point. 
Um, but this, this keeps us whole for what we presently have. Is there a way to add a line so that we could see what that number would look like if we added back like the reading specialist or math specialist or the literary uh, literacy programs or any kind of resources like that that we eliminated? I could go back and, and take a look at, I mean, some of those numbers now are a little bit older, so I'd have to make adjustments because right. time has passed by. Um, I, I could do that if that's what you would yeah. like to see. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Ms. Duffy. <clears throat> so just a point of clarification, um, uh, that 7.5% includes the uh, 1.7 million in opera grants that we received last year. That 74 million includes the $2.2 .2 million that we used in one-time money, it moves that number over to the town side. The town actually has to support that number now. So that so we received one point seven in our grants, and then the other uh, five hundred thousand is from. That was a one-time. Um, is that the tech? Like, is it, that's the technology. The five hundred thousand technology. technology. Representative Cusack, gosh, for the brain tree. Okay. Um, and I understand that uh, Braintree has applied for um, for our upper grants for the coming uh, session, um, revenue replacement, um, economic development, and one for the schools. Is that correct? And Mr. Mayor? Do you want to address that? Oh, the chair? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we continue to... First of all, utilize the uh, new um, calculation for revenue replacement, which is about 434000 We're using that in a supplemental budget, which will be discussed by the council. In addition to that, <clears throat> we've taken the police um, and uh, school um, reimbursements and reapplied for as many months as we had records for. Uh, you have to actually spend it before you get the reimbursement. But overall, when we talk about uh, this, this funding, this funding was really set up uh, to be used up until 2025. And the purpose of this funding is to help assist um, maintaining levels of service. And since our ESSA money is gone, um, we're utilizing what we have, we're most likely going to utilize um, to offset the budget um, free cash. Um, in addition to any growth that we have, we'll be using some of the free cash. But um, overall, um, the ARPA funds that are in process now, other than the revenue replacement, uh, we haven't gotten an answer yet. I mean, it takes a little bit of a process, but we'll continue to, um, to apply for those. In addition, uh, this allows us not to redistrict. It allows us to, uh, you know, depending upon how a vote goes with the, the kindergarten center, the pre-K, it would allow us to have a lot more space in our elementary schools. Um, previously, well, we had two reading specialists. We had grades K through five. We had uh, a large uh, amount of kids in, in our elementary schools. Uh, those numbers have come down significantly. In addition to that, um, if we work through the kindergarten center, and if that happens, <clears throat> we'll just have grades one through four. So we should have significant uh, amounts of space, and a lot less students uh, in, in those elementary schools. So this, this number would allow us to maintain our um, very small class sizes we have on the elementary level and, uh, and not do any redistricting. Any other questions from the committee? Do you want to say anything else? Are you, are you comfortable with the 7.5%? I'm just going to ask you straight out. Um, that's 74, 730 mm -hmm. through 869. I know that we have some opera money, but the rest of it's free cash. Are we comfortable with the 7.5? Are we going to continue to, to discuss it over the coming weeks? Do you, where do you think we stand at this moment? I think that, you know, to the chair, I think that, you know, we have worked together uh, to really make sure that we fund uh, the numbers necessary uh, to maintain and um, excel. And I think that uh, at this point, that's the number that we're working with on the budget. 
um, on our side. So, thank you. Um, just an FYI. So April 11th, which is a Tuesday on a Monday, we will have our public hearing on the budget. We'll continue to discuss this on our next meeting, which is April 3rd. Our public hearing will be on April 11th. And then this, this body will vote on the final school uh, budget on April 24th. And then the mayor again has to present it to the, to the town council after that. So as the superintendent said, we'll continue to talk about this over the next couple of weeks and we'll be voting on it on the 24th. Any other questions or comments from the committee? Okay. Uh, moving on to the task force recommendations. Uh, just to put it back uh, in the school committee's lap, uh, obviously we have gone through these. Um, we had a long conversation at our last meeting. Again, the options that were presented are up on the board in very simplified fashion. Option number one was an early elementary center at Old South. The second option was a third sending school to South Middle School. Option three was additional special education programs located at Liberty and Highlands. And then option four was the complete redistricting. At this point, I, I seek from the committee some direction. So just based on the public hearing that we had uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, I think just from what the committee's comments were, and people can correct me and, and chime in if they'd like, um, <coughs> two and option four, which include redistricting. At this point, I think they're going on the back burner. I, don't, I do think we do need to do some redistricting down the road. Um, but I think, again, we need to do our due diligence. Um, there's a lot of work that can be considered for, for both of those. Um, for option number three, special education program to Liberty or Highlands, I, I don't know that we're ready to vote on that, but I think um, just speaking to the superintendent operationally, because some of our special education programs are growing, um, you know, people are attracted to Braintree because we have excellent um, special education programs that we may need to, once the fifth graders move up to the new south, we may need to move um, a special education program to either Liberty or Highlands, um, just because we're running out of space at the ele other elementary schools. So I don't know that we need to vote on option three at this point, unless someone else disagrees. But I think, again, based on all of the comments um, from option one, the early elementary center at Old South, I believe we do have support to move that one forward. So I'm going to open it up to comments uh, on all four options from, from members of the committee. Any, any comments, sir? Mr. Devin. Thank you. Through, uh, through the chair. I've, I've stated before that I, I thought that the first option, early elementary center at the Old South, checks more than a few boxes. One, redistricting. Yes, we're going to have to look at it at some point in time. But uh, I do believe that that's something, uh, and I believe... Uh, 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 Ms. Tuppy brought up there are groups that can help educate us towards the best way to allocate through that potential minefield. Um, I like the fact that we do have to use the old South for something because we took some MSBA fast track money back in 2010. I believe it was $10 million. We believe if they won't amortize that over 20 years, we still owe it's quite a bit of money. And, and I, I, Mr. Mayor, I don't think we're in the position to start writing checks to the MSBA, no matter how nice they may think that they are. So we have to use that for something. The fact that um, we know that one of the wonderful benefits to having the uh, inadequate uh, uh, kindergarten center is the fact that you get all the groups together and all the different types of cross train teaching and whatnot modes that they could do with uh, different children and whatnot that it wound up being a positive. Um, we know that the new South has its, shall we say, being drawn out with all the curbings and things like that. It makes it easy enough to be able to, shall we say, segment that off uh, security-wise. So that checks another box. Um, the Again, when you start saying uh, special education programs, okay, that we, we know that um, we may have to put them in certain buildings because we don't have the space. Well using the old south as an elementary um uh k and pre-k center you do alleviate i my estimates are 12 to 15 classrooms that you're going to take back from home schools that are used for one type or another of, of a kindergarten center am i correct with that approximately yeah yeah so but you look and you say okay those are 15 classrooms that we can now use in a way that's more conducive to how we teach now we know back in the day when well, obviously myself, the mayor, and a few others, when we went to school, 
the teaching environment was one school, one teacher, and all things that go with that. We know that that dynamic is broken down when you have specialists that come in and working in groups and things like that. Those 15 classrooms at those homeschools are going to be imperative to us moving forward and educating our children. So uh, I don't have a problem with option one. I think the other three, without really having experts and all things that go with that to look towards that, we will have to at some point in time. That the only one I'm willing to entertain is number one. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, Ms. Tuffy. Um, I'd like to make a motion um, to ex establish um, an early uh, elementary center at the Old South. I have a motion by Ms. Tuffy. I'd like to say a couple of things. For, I didn't know if people get to no, say. Absolutely, or, yeah. Okay. Not to interrupt. Session, but yeah, session, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I agree with with um, Tiger's assessment um, assessment of options one and four. Um, I'm sorry, with options two and four. That at, you know, basically two is basically redistricting. It's um, you know redistricting Flaherty and Morrison versus the entire town. And we already discussed that four requires much more data. So I agree with that. Um, and three, I also agree, needs some input, maybe from the special needs director, um, because I wasn't sure when it says moves a special education program, whether that would create um, programs um, for number th option number three, if that would create and allows special needs students, would these programs be fully staffed? Um, and would this require staff moving between buildings? So I think before we can really think about that, we'd get some kind of feedback. Um, so, okay, with Ms. Kathy's motion on, on the board. Is there any other discussion? Matt Kukars. Thank you. Um, just going back to when we were talking about uh, the pre-K at the high school, um, one of the uh, major concerns was having those students um, separated and broken up into different uh, schools throughout the town. <clears throat> and this gives us the opportunity to keep everyone together and all the resources together. So I think this you know, takes care of uh, those concerns when we started talking about, uh, about the pre-K program. And I'm not going to announce what we want to do with that section, but we have had some discussions with some higher ed people. So we'd like to uh, bring some higher ed into the high school. So uh, I'll be working with the superintendent and the chair um, to have more discussions about that. And, uh, it would be a great spot uh, for us to do that. So I think this is, um, you know, it, it's a it's a very uh, nice building. Um, unfortunately, we were unable to accommodate making the addition that we wanted to originally, but uh, I think uh, it's it's a good use for the building. And more importantly, I think that at this point, without uh, experts uh, chiming in on how we should go about looking at um, whether we redistrict or not, I think it's important for us to maintain um, the current schools um, as is and um, fund that budget. And I think this, um, this particular option makes uh, the most sense. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? No? So I have a motion by Ms. Tuffy. Um, I'll second that. Oh, sorry. It's actually <laughs> <laughs> we had a meeting just before this uh, school building committee. Um, so the new self is still on target. So there would still be, uh, yeah, I, I, I still support this as well. I think, um, as I said, we've all commented very positively in this, you know, for all the reasons moving the pre-K out of the high school is a, is a great thing. Reusing the space at the high school is a great thing. Uh, consolidating all the kindergarten in one place. Um, and if we can make a decision sooner rather than later, so the parents who are sending their kids to kindergarten in September will know that if we vote for this, but we do need to talk to the superintendent and have him work with facilities to make sure that any changes, any retrofitting that needs to be done can get done by September. So, um, with that, I have a motion by Ms. Murphy and a second by Mr. Devon. All those in favor of, of opening the old self as an early element center as soon as possible. Um, Aye. Favor. Aye. <laughs> Aye. 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 Aye
Any, any no's? No. So that is unanimous. So Thank that's you, exciting. And then as far as the other three options are concerned, we will, we will hold them for now and table them. Thank you all. Transportation fees. All right. Next up. So at our last uh, finance and operations subcommittee meeting, we discussed the possibility of uh, expanding the bus transportation fees that we charge. Um, presently, uh, we charge uh, grades um, 7 through 12 who live more than two miles away from the building. And we transport kids within that range, grades K to, um, K to 6, uh, for no fee whatsoever. Uh, the proposal that it will be before you, and I'll try to do a better job explaining it, is to charge all families that were legally able to charge. Uh, and the way the law is written, uh, if you are a grade one to two, six student and you live two miles from your school, legally, we have to transfer you to, to be no fee associated with that. However, if you're a grade one to six student within two miles of the school, uh, we would charge you. We would charge all grades 7 to 12 students. There is no obligation to transport anybody of that age. Uh, we would not charge for tra uh, kindergarten transportation as the bus fee is considered to be part of the tuition. Uh, and then one of the reasons that we bring this forward is uh, over the course of the last couple of years, uh, the cost of transportation has gone up significantly, a lot due, due to fuel cost, but also uh, really to hire drivers and, and the like. Uh, so this could potentially increase uh, our revenue, which would be directed to transportation by approximately $200,000. In your packets uh, is the following chart, which shows you what other communities around us are charging their students for transportation. And I don't want to pick on anybody, but only because they're at the top of the list. You can see in Milton, if you have a kindergarten through grade six student within two miles of the school, it's a $350 a year charge. We are not proposing that, that amount of fee. Uh, and it's $350 across the board with a family cap of $850. Uh, you, at your leisure, can go through the list. Uh, we would be proposing a fee uh, consistent with what we are currently charging, a fee of $180 for the year uh, with a family cap initially of $360. So that would put us, uh, you know, middle of the pack. There are some schools, uh, to be fair, if I scroll down far enough, uh, where there are no fees associated with, with transporting uh, kindergarten, uh, kindergarten through grade six students. You can see Norwell, Hanover, and Mansfield, uh, but they are the exception, not the rule. Uh, so we would be looking uh, instead to implement the fees that we can to the students who we do not legally have to transport. So again, all students that we are legally able to charge, a flat fee of $180, a family cap of $360, uh, so all students living within two miles of the school in um, grades one to six and all students grades seven to 12. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, just an aside, the finance and operations subcommittee um, voted unanimously uh, to recommend this to the committee. Yeah, this is the first reading tonight. So if anybody has any questions, we can certainly um, bring it up in the, at a future meeting. But this does not include kindergarten students since they're already paying, if they're a full day K, they're already paying. So this excludes kindergarten students. So currently we are not charging uh, K to six within two miles. We charge 180 for grade seven to 12 within two miles and 180 for seven to 12 over two miles. And then 250 family cap is that, can you go to the previous slide? Sorry. 360. The table. Oh, I'm sorry. It's a different one. 250. It's 250. Previously, I'm, I'm asking. Yeah. It's 250. It's 250 currently. Okay. So it's so we're 180 across the board and 360 gap is what you're what we're recommending. So the 180 is a dollar a day, 50 cents, you know, each way. So um, and then 360 cap. If you have two or more kids, it's you know, 360 would cap it if you had more than two kids. Um and there any discussion or questions from the committee, Mr. Dittman? I have a few um comments. Um we see the the transportation uh, transportation fees and some of the things like that, but I don't think that we've accurately gone forward with the, with the fact that we have to. Was it Williams Coal has a lot that we store all of our buses at? There's a cost associated with that. It's not free. The fact that we fuel up there also 
and they give us a gallon tipping point and things such as that per year. That is not free. The fact that the buses themselves, are, are they rented or are they bought? You lease them. You lease them. Okay, so there's a lease agreement involved with that. The fact that we do have employees, we do have overhead and administrator there. So I don't think it's as, you know, when people say a dollar a day and things such as that, the fact that we're able to get, if we do it, were to move to these, that we're able to fit it under that number. And it's not 200,000. It's it's far more than that. And I think, is it three three 3.5 million, something like that? We start taking into account gasoline. Generally. I don't have to give you an inaccurate number, but to your point, uh, my close fees don't come close to covering the cost of transportation. Well, when you start talking a couple of million, but in, I'm joking, but it's serious here. The fact that we're giving you kind of an ice down here and the fact that, look, there are faces behind this administrators. The fact that there's an administrative office down there, the security, there's the, the, the fueling, uh, the maintenance that goes with them because the, the mechanic has to do that. This is not just checking a few boxes. There's a group behind this that keeps our children being transported safely. The safety checks, the training that goes to each and every driver. And I could keep going on. I don't want it, but I think it's, it's important for the people who are tuning in here this evening to know the actual cost versus this stripped down version. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Devin. Sophie. I just wanted uh, to note that there is a reduced uh, and free option for those students and families that are in need. That's correct. correct. Yep, yes, correct. thank you. Any other questions or comments? And again, this is the first reading, um, so we can bring it back to the next school committee meeting. Um, and if we were to move this forward, it would take effect in September? We would ask that it takes effect in September, correct. Okay. okay. Thank you for that. Administrative updates, are there any additional updates? I have... Um... No, the, tomorrow is um, Day on the Hill for the MECO program. We will be attending that to, to support the le legislation that supports MECO. Uh, we are, Ms. Fernandez is not here this evening, but uh, we are very close on coming up with some finalist candidates for the Ross position. Uh, and thank you for the search committees that have been working on that. Uh, but other than that, no, I do not have any immediate updates. Thank you. Moving on from the school committee, student representative updates. I'd like to go first. I can start us off. Um, I guess overall, this week is a pretty busy week for all the students over at BHS. Um, as I said at the last meeting this week, um, today we started off our stand up BHS. It's like our spirit week for March. I'm really focusing on inclusivity and kind of equity at the school and making sure we understand and listen to all of our other peers. Um, in matters of identity and accepting others. Um, so I stated the days at our last meeting, but just to repeat them, today was blue and white day, just to start off the week with our school colors. Tomorrow is colors of your country and traditional clothing. Wednesday will be decades day, going from the 2000s for the seniors all the way down to the 70s for the freshmen. And then the staff um, just found that they're dressing up as the 60s. And then... Thursday is red slash rainbow day and Friday is pink day. We'll be following the half day schedule with um, student workshops to kind of um, advertise clubs and different organizations at the high school for the underclassmen while seniors will be doing a credit for life kind of after analyzation because we're, we'll be going to that the day before this Thursday. Um, that's pretty much all I have, but for student council and everything, what was Thursday again? I'm sorry. Thursday was red slash rainbow day. Um, and then Friday was pink day. Thank you. I can interrupt. Go. No, no worries. Um, that's pretty much it for Spirit Week. And then there's a lot of other updates from a lot of other organizations in the school, which I believe everyone else will be telling you about. So starting off with this busyness of the week, we have spring sports tryouts from Monday through Wednesday for most of them. I know I just had golf tryouts first day of that today. So that's exciting for a lot of people. I could tell there was a big atmosphere of enthusiasm upon the student athlete population. And then I know Ms. Ward was just here. We do have the biliteracy exams coming up soon. So a lot of people are starting to prepare to take those 
which will take place during their language class block, or if they're taking more than one during a study hall or um, something like that. And people are able to take the exam in both the language they take at school, whether it be French or Spanish, and then also home language if they uh, speak one at home, which is really exciting for a lot of people to get that, put it on a college application or just to have it. And then another one little update from Environmental Club, there is going to be a conference at MIT um, in April where students can collaborate together and focus on how to promote environmentalism and um, a climate change activism in the young youth population. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to start off um, with, I'm sure as you all know, because you approved the but uh, broadcast journalism is... In California, they've filmed an episode of Womp TV there. Uh, they seem to be having fun. I have several friends in the program, and they, they love it. Um, other than that, um, National Honor Society had uh, had its candidates approved this week. Uh, a little under 70 candidates, I believe, were approved. Um, so congratulations all. So, yeah. Yep. Um, so this week... Uh, Earlier this week, uh, we, the Interact Club partners up with our Rotary Club in Braintree. So we had a few students, including me, who went and just spoke about the projects we've done this year uh, with their advisor, Miss Noon. So we had a little lunch with them, and uh, we talked about what we're planning to do with our school and partnering up with them to help around the community. Um, we're planning like an in-person event. I know we do a lot of community service projects at the school. But we want to partner up with the Rotary Club more often because we know it's a huge role in the town. And uh, this past Friday, actually, I was at a uh, conference with the Diversity Council run by our guidance counselor, Ms. Gonzov. So she took a few kids from the Diversity Council and we went to Sutton High School. Um, it was a connections uh, conference. So we had the opportunity of visiting many different workshops, um, whatever we're choosing. And these programs range from like diversity, equity, inclusion, all the way to um, many other activist organizations that students might want to take a part in, in their school. So we're really grateful that um, we could go to that. And I think a lot of clubs, again, are preparing for the Pride Rally and just setting up little organizations, like activities to promote their organization. So more kids next year can join and really get back into the swing of like going to clubs. So I know after COVID, it's been kind of hard and we're still coming back from that, but it's getting better. And I think this is a great way for students to have more after school activities and really branch out and make new connections. Great. Excellent. I have a few things. Uh, credit for Life is this Thursday. I know we got an invitation. Yep. Um, everybody got an invitation for Thursday if you want to stop by the Credit for Life. Terrell Room and Quincy. Yep, Terrell Room and Quincy. Thank you. And then when is the NHS induction ceremony? Because I try to go every year. April 4th. April 4th. Yeah. Thank you. What, April, what? April 4th. Yep. I'd like to go to that. Is it a Tuesday? I believe it's a Tuesday. Tuesday. <laughs> 7 p.m. 7 p.m. Okay. I'll be in the front row. Right. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, does anybody have any questions about the student rep? Just all good things. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Um, did I mention you in my best group? <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So policy and education, the update. Ms. Tuffy. Thank you. Uh, the policy and education subcommittee met on March 9th. Um, we voted unanim unanimously to move consideration of using the DESE model for superintendent evaluation for the full committee. It's fair, it's transparent, and it's centered upon actionable goals that address the needs of the district. A copy of the DESE model has been provided to all committee members in their packets. Um, the Massachusetts Educate Educator Evaluation Framework applies to every educator, teachers, and administrators alike. And the school committee is tasked with evaluating the superintendent based on four performance standards, instructional leadership, management and operations, family and community engagement, and professional culture. There's a five-step cycle, self-assessment, analysis and goals uh, setting, which is done at a public meeting, uh, plan implementation, formative assessments, and finally, a summative 
evaluation where the superintendent prepares, uh, uses to prepare his end of cycle. Which, so um, it's up to the school committee to establish um, uh, a timeline. And um, I discussed this with, we discussed this in policy and education. And I also discussed this with the chair. And uh, we felt that a um, good start time would be after the budget process was complete in May. Um, with perhaps the summit of evaluation occurring the second meeting in September. Um, and I, so so we're, we're a little late starting this evaluation cycle. Um, generally it's, it's, um, it's once a year, the first three years, and then every two years after that. So uh, if, we, if we go from May through September, then at con after that, we can go on a school, more of a school year uh, schedule. And as I said prior to this, it's, it's essentially the same thing as all the teachers and other administrators uh, use. And it's, and it's meant, um, it's meant to be used as a tool for improvement and communication. Mr. Devin, maybe you can remind me. I think we did it. We were on a two-year cycle. I think it's up to the school committee to decide how frequently to do I, it. I believe it was up to the chair to decide that. I think Not that we discussed it as far as going. Hours. But I agree. Um, and how we've done it in the past, uh, Mr. Devin and I have done it before. Um, the self-assessment, then we go through the whole process. All committee members will have input um, on each one of the standards. And then in a public meeting, as Ms. Tuffy said, we will do a, a public evaluation uh, on the four standards. And uh, in September, that will be the timeline. Okay. Um, do we need to vote on that or is that uh, is, just uh, Do people feel comfortable? Well, my well, question that. is, are these all first readings for... These are first reading. I think I think people need time. It's a long document, so I right. think people need time to read and digest. Have the other members of the committee ever done an evaluation? No. No. Just Masaros, no, no evaluation of a superintendent. Okay, so yes. So we'll give them ample time to ask questions about the process. Madam Chair. Right back. Yes, Ms. Devin. Uh, point of information. The fact that in the past when we did this, yes, it's very voluminous, but as you start going through it, there is there's certain overlap there, and there's certain, shall we say, like evaluation. So as you read through it and you start putting your evaluations in, they kind of self-form. Right. It's one of the reasons why this this was being used because it was, yes, it's voluminous, but it, it's not hard to do. Right. And I have I have a previous uh, evaluation of a previous superintendent that I have like, I guess you'd call them a cheat sheet or notes that I'd be, I'd be happy to share with people too, that kind of simplify it. Okay. Um, so the second thing the, that um, is up for consideration today is the revised concussion policy. Um, the subcommittee voted unanimously to move the updated BPS concussion policy to the full committee. Uh, changes in the policy are highlighted in your packets. Uh, concussion policy provides procedures and protocols for the management and prevention of head injuries within the Braintree Public Schools, and it must be reviewed biannually according to state law. So again, that's kind of a lengthy document and it's in there for you to uh, read through. Can I interrupt one second? Yes. Is this one time critical? To... No. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, and so uh, we have Continued our, our review of aligning the MS, MASC policy manual with the brain tree policy manual. And as we are going to be, uh, um, we have a old self and a new self, we looked at the section on facilities development. So the first two additions uh, that are in for our first reading are policy FA, which is the facilities development goals, 
that establishes the committee's goal to provide the kind of facilities which would best support a quality education program. And uh, policy FCB, that's requirement of facilities that establishes a procedure for closing a building. So those would be new to the brain tree manual. We already have policy FF naming new facilities, um, but in your packet is a draft or a revision for policy FF that aligns the brain tree policy with the MASC policy and includes the authority to rename facilities as well as name facilities. And we will be uh, most likely renaming the old South. So um, the use of procedure for submitting a name, it can be made by any resident or by a superintendent in writing to the school committee chair. Um, that's the revised policy retains the brain tree a procedure for naming a facility after an individual. Finally, it does eliminate some redundant language. So um, that is that's in your packet for consideration as a first reading for us to take up at our next meeting. Yep. Any a couple of Seven. comments. Um, and I, I understand trying to align in all things that go with that, but um, our facilities developmental goals, there's a stakeholder here that's not being, shall we say, recognized, which is our facilities director. And that part that I believe with our shared administration and uh, principals and whatnot and the other teachers, along with uh, Mr. McGurdy and his group, I, I think that they should be mentioned in, in you know, uh, what is it? FA for one. In FCB, there's a part of that, if you remember, Madam Chair, when you and I served before some years ago, the Eldred School and the Foster School had to be given back to the town. So that is going to have to be allowed for that type of a vote for this, where we take it off our inventory or because it's now being maintained by the town, is it even in our inventory? So someone's going to have to check with the charter and how we don't, shall we say, get ourselves sideways with how we're supposed to do it via charter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Devin, those are very good points. Okay. And uh, so the uh, subcommittee will meet again on um, March 30th, 5 p.m. at Colbert. Thank you, Ms. Tuffy. So we'll bring all those back to the next meeting. Um, and then it's an operation subcommittee. Uh, do you want to just go right into the scary proposal? Yeah, Ms. Lee is here. Ms. So. Lee? Welcome. Just in, in ways of an introduction, uh, Lisa Lee is a member of our tech department and uh, one of our project managers and who has been doing a lot of work looking at some security uh, proposals that the security committee came up with. Uh, at the end of last year, the security committee was looking at the um, residual money from the million dollars that the town had voted on for enhanced security in the school system. Uh, some of that money had already been spent on the audit and some access points and some matching funds that go along with a different grant. Uh, we really wanted to explore, in essence, the security of the envelope of our buildings. Like, how do you maintain the security of entrance and exits of our building? And Ms. Lee uh, was instrumental in taking a look into it and bringing the following information forward. Yeah, so what we talked about, you know, is protecting the envelope. We really want to control the access to the building. So how do we control access to the building, right? By definition, the act of selecting, granting, or restricting access to a building and spaces within the building. So really is we want to control the flow of who comes into the building and where they are allowed to come within the building. Um, and this is the reason why we want to do it. From this slide, this was from March 13th, I believe. As of today, there have been 35 shootings within the school building from K to 12. Um, looking at access control. So we want to alarm all of our doors 
and we want to have access control, which would be hard access to the building. So how you can get into the building. And so we walked around with a few vendors while the school what we can do. And these are the numbers of doors that we actually need to protect an alarm. Um, so what did we consider when we were looking at different options, right? We thought about the users, users of how they're going to use the, the equipment, administrators, how we're going to maintain it and how we can move it forward, and the infrastructure that's actually needed within our building. So we thought about the safety and the convenience for the users, because nobody wants to do something that's completely inconvenient or adds more time to their day. Uh, we thought about the administrators for improving security, monitoring traffic, and minimizing risk, right? Um, and ease of management and implementation of hardware. That's what we need to actually build it all out for the system. So what do we consider? We are putting, looking at alarms for all the doors. If you think about um, a school like Flaherty, there's an exterior door at, in every single classroom um, that can be left open by mistake or held open for whatever reason. So what we want to do is minimize that because we want to protect the envelope. We want to make sure alarm is sounded so that everybody can hear if the door is left open. Um, and the other thing we want to look at is card access. So if you want to swap over to the next slide, is, is we're looking at the motor roller access control management. And that would actually change the system that we have now, but this system will actually make it more sizable for what we need and expand to connect other systems that we are using, like cameras in the future. So what are we looking at from the committee to approve? What we look to approve is 400,000 to actually arm all the doors and add additional card reader accesses at, at the elementary schools and the high school. So if I could add to that as well. So, you know, in the conversations that we've had about security, you know, one of the slides was worst case scenario in any school in the country. But there's a lot of security that goes along with just keeping our doors closed and locked. And the alarms are critical because as much as we want to keep strangers from coming into our buildings, there are some students we don't want leaving our buildings. And uh, had some situations where some very young students missed their dog, thought it was time to go home and visit mom. Uh, and a door that you know is not readily visible from the, the main office, sometimes in our older buildings, you can get out a door without anybody knowing that. So the door alarms work both ways. Uh, you know, the work Miss Lee has done, uh, these alarms can be set on various timers. For, you know, if the door opens immediately, the alarm goes off to, uh, you know, five seconds later to 30 seconds later. And so we, we can also prevent, you know, bad situations from occurring, from ensuring that the people we want to stay in the building, stay in the building. So, you know, when we talk about the envelope, you know, a, a lot, you can always focus on the worst case scenario, but, you know, parental disputes angry neighbors um you know it, it is not the the headline grabbing news that is representative always of security security is keeping the right people in and keeping the right people out and so you know i think the security committee thought that this was a great first step in accomplishing that piece of the puzzle uh this this cost um you know again miss lee worked in a, with a number of different vendors is under what we thought it would be uh, and we continue to look at uh, there, there would be some money still left within that million dollars. And we are looking at cameras uh, at various buildings, but also some other options that uh, in the near future, we perhaps will bring back to the committee for consideration. And just to remind people, the million dollars we're referring to is the million dollars that was voted by the community in the debt exclusion. Correct. Ms. Saros, would you like to add anything? I actually, yes. Sorry, I have no voice. Thank you again for all your work on this, Ms. Lee, uh, Superintendent. Lee, this, seen this from a thought in our head, what can we do as citizens, as parents, as staff members, keeping everyone safe? That's the goal. And this is like, I'm, I can't wait. Like, I think this is, we need to really, we're being in the forefront of what needs to be done. Because just that little, oh, I got to get something from my car. I'll be right back. I'm just going to prop it. You never know. Um, I mean, sometimes you have animals that run into a school building <laughs> because the door is open. Um, this, I, I want everyone to be safe. So I'm excited. 
I know it's your passion. It's <laughs> <written on that. laughs> Just to make clear, uh, you know, the work was twofold. One was the door alarms that had been discussed. But when Ms. Lee spoke about the access panels, and, and the easiest thing to consider is when you come in here, you have to scan your card. This would include many more access points in our, our buildings across the district because we have a gym class that goes out. We, we have recess. You know, uh, so, you know, somebody, it's a long way to a card red door, but they just have to run out to the car, which is right outside. But it's putting an access point closer by. So they don't have to prop the door that they can scan themselves in quickly. So it is about addressing the temptation to say, I'll just, I'm only going to be out for a minute. And again, containing that envelope. <clears throat> so the proposal is twofold. It's, it's increasing access with the cards. So more doors you'll be able to access. Right. And then it also will alarm doors that we don't want open. And we can figure out the timing of whether it's 30 seconds or five seconds or whatever. And an alarm going off is, you know, someone's trying to come in, someone's trying to go out. Every exterior door. And it was 40, was it 44 additional doors is from the previous slide? Sorry, I'm going to make you go back. Okay. Is that what the last column is? 164 alarms, 44 access points. Is that so correct? That's, that's what that 400,000 covers. Yeah. What does that column say at the top? Access, can, access, oh, access, access door alarms. For access, okay. Again, access to the panels. So, okay. so 164 doors would be alarmed and there'd be 44 additional access doors. Okay, or access card readers. Nick, of course. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> when I met, back in 2020, when I went through all the different buildings and um, all the years at you know, um, School Committee of Saros and two other people, uh, were talking to me prior to me becoming mayor, it was important to put this, you know, to put some funding into the that exclusion. You know, it, we talked earlier about the roofs that we're doing at all these different elementary schools. And these are things we just could have never done before because we didn't have the money. And um, for me, it's really, it, it's exciting to know that, you know, this million dollars and we really weren't sure how much we could do with it. And I know that there was a, a pretty extensive audit, but I think this is, you know, such a significant thing to do and great use of the funding. Um, just from, you know, driving around, you know, there are doors that get propped open sometimes, unfortunately. And, uh, you know, you can't police that all the time, but this certainly will do that. And I, and I commend you for uh, putting this together. This is uh, going to make a big difference. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Devon. Thank you, through the chair. Um, I do know that we've also used some of that money as far as monitoring um, social media and things such as that. Didn't we join in with that as far as using that? Yeah, yeah. So it's not just door alarms. Let's remember what safety is. It's many different ways of rendering these buildings safer. And it's done many different ways. You can do it with these wonderful alarms, and there's many different ways you can use these alarms uh, defensively, uh, offensively, if you think that there's a threat. Light them all up. Obviously, go to the office and call the police, and their response times are lickety split. They know how important this is to us with all the other things that have gone on in our country. I believe we, we're on, on pace with that. But I believe that this is a start. This isn't an ending. I do believe at some point in time, we're going to have to have, you know, we know up to high school, individual IDs and things like that. Who's on campus in any given time so that you're not looking for a child when they're at home? And we know that we do have taking names and things like that as far as if a child's being there. And I, But I've gotten a couple of calls saying, yeah, your child's not at school. It's like, yeah, I dropped her off. And these things happen, but with an ID situation. So... I think people have to understand this is a wonderful first start, as well as some of the other things that we've done. That $1 million, if you think that that's the end of it all, that is just the beginning. The audit gave us other steps that we're going to have to really look at and make choices as to how we're going to go forward so that we can have a comprehensive plan that makes sure not just our students, but our administration and our teachers and everyone else that works for us is, works in a safe environment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Through the chair. Um, so now that we just voted on the Old South and we're taking Manhattan offline, how does that, how will that, those two buildings, you know, factor into this? 
Well, you can look at the mad grid numbers if it we just move the resources to cells, right? Um, you know, an individual alarm is not cost prohibitive. The package is cost prohibitive. So, you know, as as decisions get made about Old South and what happens to Manatee, we'll make the smaller adjustment internally. Okay. And when would this start? Uh, as soon as you guys vote, we're going to try to get the request for bids out there. And so the million dollars, this is 400000 yes. The audit was 50. 50. So it still leaves us about 600000 or 550 no, no, You're closer to 400 at this point. 400. 400 remaining, remaining balance. Remaining. The Security Committee will continue to discuss. Yep. We've already looked at um, some other options. Again, cameras are something we, we still uh, can, you know, we know we need cameras, but we're going to look at what the options within the funding that we have available might be. And again, we'll come back to the committee with that when we're ready. And I'm sure a point of information. Um, we know that the back part of the high school had two doors. Didn't we take that the rebuilding of those doors out of this fund because it was deemed to be a safety situation? No, uh, the town facilities took care of that. We did not move it into this grant because we knew we were kind of going to cooperate with the package That's what you have tonight. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> well, it's, it, it, it takes all of us. I'm tell them, tell them. All of us, tell them. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Mr. Chair, yes. can I make a motion to accept this? You I'll also second that. Yeah, I have a motion by Ms. Saros and a second by Mr. Devon. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That is unanimous. Great job. Ms. Lee, thank you so much for your work. Thank you. Okay. Um, and then just the other update on the on the Finance and Operations Subcommittee. We've covered everything tonight. We went over the budget, um, the security. Ms. Lee presented the security uh, to to finance and operations, and we voted to move it forward to tonight, and also the bus fees as well. Same thing, we voted for move it forward to this, the committee. We will meet on March 30th, 6 p.m. after policy and uh, policy and education. So I just want to remind people again, our next school committee meeting is April 3rd. We continue to talk about the budget. Um, and we have also invited the director of facilities to come talk and give us uh, an update on the merger and uh, just an update overall um, on facilities, facilities, um, what's being done, what's being worked on. And then again, our public hearing for the FY24 is on Tuesday, not a Monday, a Tuesday, April 11th. And then the school committee will be voting on our budget again on Monday, April 24th. So those are our upcoming meetings. Um, so with that, may I have a motion to adjourn? So move, Madam Chair. Sorry, Mr. Devon, second Sorry. Ms. Saros. Mr. Devon. Aye. Saros. Aye. Nick, of course. Aye. Ms. Caldwell Man. Aye. Ms. Tuffy. Aye. Dave votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you.